here and hear your word. Lord, we pray that you please fill Jesse with your Holy Spirit as he comes to teach us some very important realities about being disciples indeed. Dear God, I pray you please help us to all be disciples who are true disciples, real disciples, and that we would seek to uh, make other people into disciples as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 The thought of my message this evening is, A Disciple Indeed. Look down at John chapter 8 and verse number 30. The Bible says, And he spake these words, as he spake these words, many believed on him. Verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus doesn't have a lot of nice things to say in chapter 8 of the book of John. He had just finished telling the Jews that if they did not believe that he was the Messiah, that he was the Son of God, that he was the Lord in human flesh, that they would die in their sins. He would proceed to tell them that they were of their father the devil because they didn't believe that he was the Messiah and indeed they wanted to kill Jesus. And he makes perhaps what is one of the most uh, powerful statements of his deity. He compares uh, the fact that uh, it says that Abraham knew of his day, he saw and rejoiced to see it was glad, and they said, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus Christ being about the age of thirty at this time. And then Jesus Christ says that before Abraham was, I am. Makes this profound and powerful statement. Well, these words didn't persuade most of the people who were there. However, according to the middle of the passage that John records, and this is actually why the story is included in the Gospel, some people did believe in this message of Jesus. Some of those Jews who were listening to Jesus say these very negative words, saying some of these very profound statements about who He is, which He would very infrequently do because it would endanger Him. He would be put in danger of being killed, as we even see at the end of the chapter. He would often try to convey himself away and oftentimes not walk in Jewry because he didn't want to be killed before his time. He says often in the Gospel of John that his hour was not yet come. So many people were convinced and they believed in the Gospel. They got saved and thank God that they believed the Gospel. But then Jesus, after that, proceeds to say this again in verse number 31. Then, after they believed the Gospel, after they got saved, after they received the gift of eternal life, as Jesus himself testifies in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me has everlasting life. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, not before, is you don't have to be a disciple of Jesus to be saved. You don't have to follow him to be saved. You don't have to do any works to be saved. Only after you get saved are these things even a question in your life. If someone should ask the question, what should I do, and they're not saved, I'm not going to tell them to read the Bible and go to church and get baptized. I'm going to tell them, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But after someone gets saved, once someone believes the gospel message, what will we do then? Well, then we'll be like Jesus. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. I want to notice three things from this statement of Jesus. First of all, he begins by saying, if. You see, being a disciple is contingent upon you. Your salvation is based upon what Jesus did. But your obedience to Christ determines whether you're going to be his follower, whether you're going to be his faithful disciple, which is not uh, needed for your salvation, but it ought to happen. God expects it from us. He has set out these good works for us beforehand. If you continue in my word. Notice that he says, if you continue, it's not just someone who merely comes to church once, someone who merely reads through the Bible one time, say, but someone who faithfully, continuously does the things of God. He says, if you continue furthermore, so that's the first thing, if you continue, number two, in my word, not just the words of man or the word, the ideas and philosophies of one particular group of people. The Bible says you continue in my word. Paul says that we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Paul says that we preach Christ crucified. So the words that we preach are supposed to be those of Christ, the words of the Lord, the only words which are able to sanctify people, as Jesus himself testifies in John chapter 17, when he says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. So it is the words of Christ you must continue in, not necessarily the words of a man. Our loyalty should be to Christ. Our loyalty should be to the head, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you continue, number two, if you continue in my word, the words of the Lord, the words I hold in my hand right here in the King James Bible. And number three, if you continue my word, he says, then are ye my disciples indeed. That is to say, you are a true student, follower, learner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just someone who merely believes on the gospel, but 
after having believed the gospel, makes that commitment to also walk in the same steps of the Lord. Not to be saved or to go to heaven, but so that their life might pattern, be patterned after the Lord Jesus Christ, they might be pleasing to God, and that they might live a life uh, which actually has value, which is not worthless in the sight of the Lord. Continue in my word, he says, if you do that, you'll be my disciples indeed, my true disciples. We know earlier from the book of John, there were many people who were insincere disciples of Jesus. Look back. John chapter number 6. The 666 of the Bible. John chapter 6 and verse number 66. Here we have other disciples of Jesus, so called by the text. And it says that after he had preached a very hard message, very difficult to understand, about eating his flesh and drinking his blood to receive eternal life, the Bible says in John 6, 66, uh, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. I would say these people did not continue in the word of Christ, and therefore they were not his disciples. Or they were, as the text says, but they were not his disciples indeed. So tonight what I want you to do is to realize that when you preach the gospel to someone, when you save a soul from hell, when you pull someone out of the fire, you want to make sure that that person who you saved becomes a disciple, and a disciple indeed. Someone who continues in the word of Christ. Someone who continues growing in Christ, and someone who goes on unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Let's turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts in chapter number 20. How somebody receives the word of God, as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, that they received the word of God as the word of, uh, the word of God as the word of God, not the word of men. Uh, how someone handles the word of God, and how somebody lives the word of God. James talks about being a doer and not a hearer only. These determine the course of their Christian life. It is the single greatest factor, how you handle the Word of God, how you receive the Word of God, how you live through the Word of God, which determines what kind of a life you're going to have here below. Acts chapter 20 and verse number 32. The Word of God is the only thing which is able to bring us to the point where we can become mature Christians who are able to do something significant for the Lord. Paul says to the church at Ephesus, then assembled, uh, uh, he says in Acts chapter 20 and verse number 32, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Here Paul says of the word of God multiple things. Let's just isolate one statement. He says of the word of God, which he here calls the word of his grace, the gracious words that proceeded out of Christ's lips, the gracious words that were penned down by the authors of your uh, inspired of the spirit of God. He says those words are able to build you up. They're able to, in the words of Scripture, edify you. They're able to make you to be someone who actually has strength, power, wisdom, intelligence, and can be someone who is able to do a mighty work for the Lord. God expects us, therefore, to continue in His Word. The Word of God is necessary for the Christian's growth. In fact, in the church, in the book of Hebrews chapter 13, it is the people who labor in the word and doctrine, it says, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, who are especially those who are supposed to be counted worthy of double honor. And Hebrews 13 says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. You remember people in the church, he says, primarily, of course, they can do many things, but the most important thing you can do for someone, the most beneficial thing you can do for another person, is to speak to them the word of God. Give to them God's words. Our words don't last forever. The all of man is a grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And your words are not always going to come to pass. Your plans can sometimes be shot down by God. But God says, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return it to be void. It shall accomplish that which I please. So God gives forth his word, and the great was the company of those that published it, and God makes sure that it has the effect it's supposed to have. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Essential to being a disciple indeed is the emphasis in your life and the life of that person who you're going to train, that person who you're going to teach, that person who you're going to guide, that the Word of God is preeminent, that the Word of God has highest place in their life. Ephesians chapter number 4. Our job, all of us as Christians, is to make other people, not just ourselves, but after ourselves too, becoming mature, to grow in Christ. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 of five offices that were in the early church, and he gave, verse 11, Ephesians 4, 11, and he gave some apostles, those are eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus, chosen by God to be ministers of that same message that Jesus had indeed risen from the dead, 
and some prophets, people who are giving forth special revelation of the Word of God, particularly in the first century, and some evangelists, preachers of the gospel full-time, and some pastors and teachers, those who are ministering to a flock, caring for the needs uh, of the people there. So these offices he gives, he says, for what purpose? Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now I notice here of these threefold uh, purpose for the church, he says that it's for the first, the perfecting of the saints, those are Christians. You know, I it could introduce myself as missionary or evangelist Jesse. I prefer the title Saint Jesse. Uh, and uh, some people might think that that's crazy, but that's because you have a Catholic idea. Saints are not dead people in the catacombs of the Catholic Church. Saints are believers, even by the same book, Ephesians chapter 1. Paul says to the saints and faithful brethren which are in Christ at Ephesus. So Paul is writing to living people, not dead people. And he says to the saints, the believers, are those that we are supposed to perfect. Once someone gets saved, that doesn't mean that your job's over. That means that now I have to perfect that person. Now you say, oh, this is talking to the pastors, this is talking to the evangelists, this is talking. But the Bible says that they're supposed to be an example to the flock. So it's true that they have the burden of most of this work, but all of us are supposed to in some way be a kind of mini evangelist. We're supposed to preach the gospel. All of us in some way are supposed to minister to the needs of other people. All of us in some way are supposed to speak the word of God one to another. And the third point, he says, for the edifying of the body of Christ, what I earlier talked about, to build people up, to take, as it were, blocks and put them spiritually to the people. Now, why do we do this? Well, verse number 14, Paul says that we henceforth be no more children. God doesn't want us to be immature Christians. He doesn't want us to be people who are tossed, he says, to and fro by the slight of men, by the deception of men, and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. You know, there are many evil, ungodly people who want to deceive others, who want to destroy others. And if you don't teach them the Word of God, then Satan will teach them from his television. If you don't teach them from the scriptures what they are to do to please God, then the devil will teach them from the rap song and the rock song on the radio how they can make him happy. If you don't teach them from the scriptures what they have to do to make sure their life counts for Christ, then the devil will do something from the school system to teach them how they can make their life ruined and destroyed. You must teach the word of God to those whom you say. You must encourage them and strengthen them and speak to them Christ's word if they are to be disciples indeed. If you're content just to save souls, I thank God for you that you're even doing anything for Christ, as there are many today who believe the gospel and do nothing for God. But let's go a step further tonight. Let's not just get salvations. Let's also get disciples. And let's not just get disciples. Let's get disciples indeed. He concludes the passage in verse 15, saying, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. God wants us again to be complete. He wants us to grow up in him and to become, in a way, spiritually independent. Not just us, but those that we lead to Christ also. So tonight, what I really want to do is help you with the philosophy that my brother John and I have had over in Uganda for the past three years, approximately, of discipleship. What exactly do we do when someone comes to church? Are we just treating them like a normal church member, like everyone else? What do we do? How is it, for example, that someone can go from going to hell one week to a couple months later saving uh, hundreds of people? How does that happen? Is it just that they come to church once, twice, three times, and all of a sudden they save people? No. Here's what actually happens. There's someone who cares for their soul. There's someone who uh, bows down their time and teaches them the Word of God, not just in a general church setting, but in a personal setting, in a somewhat, sometimes, individual setting. Turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians and chapter number 3. Let me explain to you this idea, and this is very important for you to understand in a philosophy of ministry, whether you be a full-time minister or whether you just be volunteering a couple hours to the ministry in some way or form, that there are basic, essential things that every Christian has to know and that they must implement in for their life to be successful for the Lord. And that is to say, as soon as they believe on the gospel, there are things, just like when a child is born, which are critical for their development. And if you do not give those things to them, if you do not 
uh, help that person in this spiritual way, then their growth will be stunted. The author of Hebrews, for example, talks of the first principles of the oracles of God. Certain things that are kind of fundamental and essential that everyone should know or it's expected for everyone to know. But of course, if the person just got saved, you can't expect them just coming to church to know everything that I'm going to talk about today. So therefore, it is necessary for you to have, I think, a program of discipleship for new believers. This is why, for example, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, that we were willing uh, uh, to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. What Paul means to say is that when he went to Thessalonica, he found that uh, he needed to give them a good example of how to work. And so therefore the Apostle Paul very likely did not even take any funds from Thessalonica, rather he just labored with his own hands, just like he did at Corinth. Another sense in which he could be talking is the fact that Paul loved them like he did a father and like a mother would love her child. And of course, how would a father and mother love their children? To the point where they would teach them the word, teach them the scriptures. Bringing them up, Paul says, even elsewhere in Ephesians 6, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So you can see various analogies then in the scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, to why we should disciple new people, why we should humble ourselves and repeat information to new people. Just like you when you go soul winning, uh, unless you're extremely intelligent, you can preach 15 different versions of the same gospel. I think that's really complicated. But uh, unless you're like that, I preach the same gospel presentation to everyone that I preach the gospel to. So the same thing, that we have not just the gospel to give to people, but also certain essential information that everyone should know. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. My point is different from Paul's point, but let me show you what Paul says that will illustrate what I'm saying. He says, And I, brethren, 1 Corinthians 3, 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. Now, Paul is talking to the Corinthian church, which was divided and having factions and strife and so on. So this is why he kind of insults them, saying that you're like little babies spiritually, you have not matured. Clearly, by the way you're behaving, he says you're like spiritual children. But look what Paul says again carefully in uh, verse 2 at the beginning. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. Here we see that when someone is a spiritual child, you need to feed them a spiritual meal that is accommodated to their age. Meaning that there are certain things, certain essential things, that they must know. Now, I'm no expert at this, but I know that when a child is born, they have to have their mother's milk. They need to have something that is going to nourish them, to allow them to grow and to become uh, uh, strong and to uh, come up in years. Not just with that of a parent with a child, but also like a schoolmaster to a student. Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, referring to the gospel, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now what Paul is expressing is this idea that the law shows us that we are sinners and that we need to trust in Jesus Christ as the Savior. That's all it's good for. The law can't save you. The law can't give you eternal life. The law, in the words of the book of Hebrews, made nothing perfect, but the bringing of better hope did. Paul says that if there could have been a law which could have given life, verily righteousness showed him by the law. But the scripture has included all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So here his point is of the gospel, but I think the point can also be taken for those who are, after believing the gospel, also disciples. That they need a schoolmaster. They need someone who's going to teach them the elementaries of Christianity. They need someone who's going to teach them the basic principles, like a schoolmaster would to a student. And eventually there's going to become a graduate. Uh, thirdly, uh, in Isaiah chapter 27, the Bible describes that God is like a, a husbandman over a vineyard. So it's like a husbandman guarding and protecting a vineyard. Isaiah 27 and verse number 2, the Bible says, In that day sing ye unto her a vineyard of red wine. I, the Lord, do keep it, I will water it every moment. Lest any hurt it, I will keep it night and day. There's a phase, again, I'm no expert on agriculture, but I suppose that when you plant a seed, there's a phase in which it is very vulnerable, in which it could easily be destroyed, trampled down, eaten by some insect or eaten by some animal. So you need to take precautions to prevent this from happening. You need to do something, for example, to keep the chickens away from the tomato patch, as it were. You need to stop something from coming and disturbing the vine. So it is with a new believer. The devil really wants to devour them. He really wants to destroy them. 
they are easy pickings. They're easy targets for the devil. And he knows that if he can get that person before you, strengthen them and perfect them and grow them in Christ, then I'll make sure this person never does anything for God. I'll make sure that they don't become a soul winner. Oh, it's too late. I can't take them down to hell with me. But I can make sure that when they go to heaven, they'll be least. And they don't bring anyone else there too. So you see, the devil is a roaring lion, and he wants to destroy people. So we need to make sure we guard that vineyard. We need to make sure we graduate that student, so to speak. We need to make sure we nourish that little child. This is the idea of discipleship, that when someone first gets saved and comes to church even, and is demonstrating a fact that they're interested in the things of God, you've done proper follow-up on the person, they've come to God's house, they desire to continue in the word of Christ, let's make sure they become a disciple indeed, and indeed give them that biblical teaching that is necessary. In fact, in order to do this, you have to have commitment like many great men of God in the Bible did. Not just to preach to a large congregation or a large group of people. I remember there were times where I would go and preach to a large group of people, so I thought, but it was actually a big church with one or two people in it. And you have to learn to t serve other people in a lowly place. Uh, as the hymn says, does the place you're called to labor seem so small and little known? It is great if God is in it and he'll not forget his own. Little is much when God is in it. Amen. And you should never think, oh, that's just one person. That's just two people or five people. What are they going to do? Oh, I'll wait till I can preach one preacher might think to a thousand people. Well, the Bible says if you're faithful in little, then your God will set you over much. But if you're unfaithful in that which is least, how shall God give you the true riches? How will God give you the whole congregation? It doesn't make sense. So you need to prove yourself faithful in this way. But beyond that, all of us, whether preacher full-time or not, should be people who desire to teach others. And if you're a woman and you're disqualified because you're a woman from being this kind of formal teacher in this way, well, you can still bring people to the teacher. You can still be someone who encourages others to bring, like we have at our church. There are many women who are soul winners, and they get people saved, and they bring them to church and they schedule them for the discipleship lessons that we have. And they ask, sometimes the women bring more than the men. And you see, that they're, they're exceedingly zealous. So you should be like those women too. Jesus Christ, of course, he would often teach little groups of people. In Mark chapter 4, the Bible says of the disciples that when they were alone, Jesus, he expounded all things to his disciples. He's just preaching to a handful of people. There are other times where Jesus wouldn't even preach to all the disciples of his, his 12, but he would also preach just to two or three. Where he would take, for example, Peter, James, and John up to the Mount of Transfiguration and give them their own personal uh, uh, event and, and message thereafter, telling them, don't even tell anyone about this. Don't post this on YouTube, as it were, you know. <laughs> and Matthew chapter number 24, when Jesus preaches the sermon uh, on Mount Olivet, of the Olivet Discourse, that's only to a handful of his disciples, not even all of them. So you can see that Jesus was committed uh, to preaching to individuals or to small groups of people. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus Christ preaches to Mary. And Martha, she doesn't want to listen to the sermon. She's uh, too busy serving, cumbered about much serving. But Jesus Christ continues preaching. And he becomes, at the end, he says, oh, Martha, why didn't you listen to my sermon? You know, she, she was too busy doing uh, worldly things. But he says, Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. You're not going to be able to get the same blessing that Mary got because you're not interested to hear my words here. Here you see that Jesus goes to the meek and lowly house and he goes and preaches to just a few. The same thing with the apostles when it says in Acts 5 or Acts 20 that they would go to every house or in every house or from house to house. This doesn't just mean that they're preaching the gospel to people. It probably also means that they're preaching messages to people where they're preaching individual sermons maybe to just a little household of people. Also, some evangelists in the Bible, like Paul, can frequently be seen, as he did one time in the city of Jerusalem, with Trophimus in Ephesian. What do you think Paul is doing walking around with this man, doubtless preaching to him some scripture, maybe having good fellowship with him? Paul would often spend time with individuals like Timothy, like Titus. He would work with them. He would work with them as a father with a son, and he would teach them the word of God. And, of course, we know of the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, he uh, hears the gospel by the message the mouth of Philip. And not only does he hear the gospel, but presumably he asked about baptism. In Acts chapter 8, verse 36, it says, And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? You know, I've had that happen a few times to me, where someone comes and says, Can I be baptized? But that only happens after they begin to hear the teaching. So you must begin to disciple people. You must begin to teach people the word of God in the basic things like baptism. Paul, at the end of his life, in Acts chapter 28, it says that when he was in his own hired house towards the close, close of his ministry and his life, it says he received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God 
and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ, which means not just the gospel, but everything in the Bible, with all confidence, no man forbidding him. So you can see that Paul would actually preach. One person comes in and asks Paul a Bible question. So he says, I got a sermon for you, and he preaches a 20-minute sermon to them. That person leaves. A family comes in and says, Paul, what does the Bible say here? And he expounds to them the scripture. So you can see that Paul, Jesus, Philip, all these great men in the Bible had a commitment, not just to preaching to large crowds of people, as they often did, but to preaching even to individuals and small groups of people. This is the idea then of discipleship, that we should teach people essential things that they must know to be successful in the Christian life. Now, for our own personal discipleship program that we use in Uganda, there are 10 lessons that we want everyone to hear. Now, obviously there are going to be things in these lessons that are hammered in different ways and different forms in every sermon in some shape or form. However, I want to make sure that everyone who comes to church, if they're there for a long enough time, one, two months, they're going to know all the things that I'm going to note right now. Now, what, what governs what lessons you should teach them? Isn't there like hundreds of lessons you could teach them where you just kind of go through the entire Bible? Well, here's the thing. In order for someone to be mature, there are two aspects. The first aspect of spiritual maturity, according to the Bible, would be that of wisdom or knowledge. Things that you know and apply in that knowledge. Uh, the Bible says, My son, my heart shall rejoice even mine when thy lips speak right things. So God wants you to know those word, and he wants you to apply his word in your life, where you can use knowledge aright, where you can take the words of the wise, where you can take the words of the scripture and use them in a proper way to change the way you behave, change the way you act, and change the world even around you. So it's your knowledge, but also it is your behavior. What character you have or what virtue you have? How is your behavior matching up with the scripture? So then, what is necessary when we teach discipleship, we think, for them to know, is the gospel, salvation by faith and eternal security. So we have two lessons then, where we talk about in Romans chapter 3, verse 28, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And this is not just a rehashing of the gospel presentation that I preach to them when I meet them on the road or I meet them at their door. This is a thorough hour, hour and a half, sometimes, if you're my brother John, two or two and a half hours explanation of salvation by faith. Now, can you imagine hearing that salvation is only by faith from 100, 200, 300 Bible verses? That's what this is. The idea is that you want to make the person fully to understand the gospel. If they did not get saved when you preached the gospel to them, but you thought they got saved, or sometimes when you preach to them, but they decide not to believe, but you schedule them to come anyway, and they hear that lesson, we have testimonies upon testimonies of people actually getting saved after that lesson. People who hear that message, and then they get saved from it. Not just that, but also the doctrine of eternal security. The gospel is necessary for them to understand. Therefore, we also teach them, as Jesus does, that I give unto them eternal life. And if they are Christ's disciples, they are Christ's sheep too. And the Bible says that I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So these two we go very thoroughly on. Obviously, there's more that you could talk about. And you could create your own discipleship method as this church. But I'm just telling you what we do. Uh, then beyond that, there are the behavior. So what they ought to know or what they ought to know very strongly, that way they're not dissuaded, is that salvation is by faith and eternal security after already initially hearing the gospel and in most cases actually believing it. But then there are what we identified as eight behaviors or eight practices in Christianity that are necessary. And we get these from the commands of Scripture that tell you you must do these things. Now again, there are hundreds of commands and expectations upon us. But if we can quantify them, if we can reduce them down to the eight essential daily or weekly or uh, necessary practices for the Christian, they would be probably this. First of all, to be baptized. This is the first obedience. The first step of obedience is often called the God commands in Acts 2 and Acts 22 to be baptized. So that after someone gets saved, they ought to be baptized as a symbol that they believe the gospel and as a public profession of their faith in the gospel. The second is that of church attendance, as the Bible commands, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 15. Jeremiah chapter 15. The third uh, lesson on these practices is that of Bible reading. The Bible says of the king, and we all being God, kings and priests, after we believe the gospel, it says he shall read therein all the days of his life. A command to read the Bible. Again, in the fourth, we have prayer. The Bible commands us in 1 Thessalonians to pray without ceasing. Again, in the fifth, Bible memorization. God tells Joshua, and by extension, anyone who would be under his command, so to speak, as Joshua in the Old Testament is symbolizing Jesus in the New, thou shalt meditate therein day and night in the words of God in the book of the law. Again, six, soul winning. 
God commands, Jesus does, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Again, singing and music. The Bible says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, and finally giving. Jesus commands us to lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. These eight practices seem to come up, particularly the seven, after the baptism is just once, but after the, the, the other seven, where you have to constantly be talking about people should be in church, how they need to read God's Word, how they ought to pray, how they ought to memorize the Bible, how they should go soul winning, how they should be singing godly music, and how they ought to be giving faithfully to God. And therefore, we have devised this method to where everyone can hear clear, uh, thorough teaching on this, that way they will strongly understand. How does it work then? Well, I think the best way to do it here would probably be that after someone gets saved, you schedule them to come to church. And once they come to church, the person who brought them to church, if they feel comfortable, or maybe some person in the ministry, or if it's a woman, of course, maybe their husband, or maybe uh, someone else in the church, another man, uh, they would direct them to a lesson of this person. They would probably connect with that person. And they would say, hey, are you able to come maybe an hour early on Sunday morning at 9 a.m.? and I can teach you one of these discipleship lessons. Or can you stay an hour after in one evening service or whatever, or some other day of the week? Can you come, for example, on a Monday evening, or can you come on a Saturday morning or whatever? And of course you would work that out uh, in, with Pastor Fannin, but the idea here is that you want to invest time in such a person and teach them, even if it's just one person. Now, my brother John and I, because we, of course, have big numbers of salvations with from not only us, but also our disciples, we actually have not just one person we're teaching now, but as we began, but now we often have 10, 15, 20 people at once. So it almost becomes like another church service, you know. But the same, they're getting God's Word. They're continuing in Christ's Word, and therefore they become Christ's disciples indeed. At the end of such a discipleship lessons, that they go through these 10 lessons, our understanding is that the person is very mature. They understand the Word of God. They understand the Gospel, no, no ifs, ands, or buts, no false prophet can deceive them. They understand what they ought to be doing, and for the great majority, those people are doing what they ought to be doing. So then, this brings them to the perfect man, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, and now, as they come to church, they're going to understand more. Now, as they're coming to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, they're going to be more instrumental. Now they're going to become more functional. Now they're becoming more like a member, where they can do something great for others. Amen. Let me then move on to the last thing I want to describe, and that is just to give you a sample of one of these discipleship lessons. Now, I'm not going to go for an hour and a half. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just take part of one of the lessons. Because this is the Bible Revival, I'm going to talk about Bible reading, lesson three that we have. And I'm going to give you a sample of this. What I'm going to do is take the middle of my Bible reading discipleship lesson, and I'm going to describe to you four things that the Bible is to you. And these are ought to be motivations to you to read God's Word. Why am I telling you this? Because in the beginning I told you that your relation to the Word of God affects your life. Yes, God wants you to come to church. Yes, He wants you to pray. Yes, He wants you to memorize the Bible. Yes, He wants you to go soul winning. Of course God wants you to sing His music. Of course God wants you to give. And if you had not been baptized after your salvation, surely God wants that too. However, none of these have the same power as Bible reading. Your relation to the Word of God, do you read God's Word, is so essential. It's so necessary. It is the single thing that I found of why people fall away. Why they come to church, they're faithful to God, but then they walk no more with us. Because they don't continue in Christ's Word. Because they're not reading the Bible. I've had lots of people get baptized, hundreds even, but they're not, and many of them are not in church anymore. I've had so many people come to church five, ten, fifteen times, but many of those are not in church anymore. I've had many people tell me of the many prayers that they make to God but many of those people are not in church right now. Some people would even be able to quote to me an entire book of the Bible, but right now many of those same persons are not in church faithfully. I've had many people go soul winning with me, some people even saving 30 people, 50 people, in some cases 100 or 200 people across multiple months, but many of those people, some of them are not in church right now. I've had many people get all the worldly music off their phone and begin to sing only psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, but a lot of those people are not in church right now. We've even had some very generous people who would give generously to the church, but a lot of those people are not in church right now. But let me tell you from the bottom of my heart, there's only one thing that I've found that when someone falls away, they did not do, and that's read the Bible. 
And if you read God's word, that is the strongest guarantee that you will not fall. Because if you continue in his word, then you're his disciple indeed. Let's tell you what the Bible is to you and why you ought to read it then. I just read Jeremiah chapter number 15. <coughs> First of all, <coughs> God's word is your spiritual food. Now, all of us love to eat, right? A lot of people eat multiple times in the day. In fact, it's almost unheard of for an American not to eat three meals a day. In Ugandan uh, uh, terminology, they like to eat too. In fact, many people get very angry when you tell them that they should not eat lunch, so to speak, because, hey, we're just going to go soul winning for this few hours and you can eat a big breakfast or you can eat a big dinner, but you shouldn't eat lunch here. They say, no, no, I have to have my lunch. You see, lots of people love food. They have a great attachment or a great desire to food. And it's not wrong for us to desire the things that we need to live, but there is another kind of life that we're supposed to be living too. We're supposed to have the physical life, but Jesus Christ says that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God doth man live. Jeremiah, he was someone who loved the word of God. Jeremiah 15, verse 16. The Bible says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. New believers, I don't expect them to understand this idea. This is a very profound thought. So when I take people soul winning, for example, I'm very easy on them. When I tell them to read the Bible, for example, I go very easy. I just say, read a couple chapters, read a few chapters. But as someone begins to mature in life, they begin to realize what's really important. And they begin to be like Jeremiah, who is not excited about a meal, who doesn't uh, lick his chops, so to speak, at a, uh, the prospects of getting some delicious chicken or some kind of a steak. But rather, Jeremiah says, thy words were found and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. Jeremiah is excited. Jeremiah is happy. Jeremiah is joyful because he can eat the word of God. Obviously, he's talking metaphorically, but the idea is still the same. Job says, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Now, let's ask Job. Job, let's put the Bible on one plate here, and let's put your meal for today that you need to survive physically over here. Which one will you want, Job? Well, Job would say, give me the Bible. In fact, Job would eventually die of malnutrition because he would keep choosing the Bible every single day. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. God's word is your spiritual food. There were two times in the Bible indeed where people ate God's word. Ezekiel eats a little book and uh, John in Revelation 10 is given a little book and he says, I ate it up and it was in my mouth sweet as honey and in my belly bitter. Peter, 1 Peter chapter number 2. Peter compares the word of God, as others do, to something that's edible, something that you can eat, something that you can ingest. 1 Peter in chapter number 2 and verse number 2, the Bible says, As newborn babes, or babies, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Here you can see the word of God as often is compared to something that you can eat, like milk, in this case, drinking it. It's also compared in the Bible to honey, sweeter also than honey. It's compared to meat. It's compared to bread. The Bible calls it in Deuteronomy 8.3. So God compares his word to many different things that you can actually eat because we are to view the word of God as something that we must eat for our subsistence. We must view the word of God as our spiritual food. Now, what does this mean for you today? Well, that means the same way that you view food, at least you ought to view the word of God in a similar way. Let's go to Proverbs 13. Proverbs in chapter number 13. Let's think about how you eat. Let's think about your, your view of food. First of all, most people eat every day. And I say most people eat multiple times in the day. Jesus talks of our daily bread in Matthew 6, 11. And the Bible describes in the, even the Old Testament when they, for example, were fed, God would feed them in the morning and the evening. He would feed them bread and flesh uh, every day. Bread in the morning and, or men in the morning and quail in the evening. When God fed Elijah, he fed them in 1 Kings 17 with uh, uh, things to eat. The ravens brought him in the morning and in the evening. So you can see that they're eating every day. People often eat all the time, every single day. Just like you eat every day, then you should view the Word of God the same way. You should read the Bible every day. You see, many people, are, they make sure they get their breakfast, they make sure they get their lunch, and they make sure they get their dinner. I'm glad for you that you're being healthy and nutritious. But I think you need to nutrify your spirit. You need to make sure you get breakfast, lunch, and dinner of this. You need to make sure you're reading the Bible every single day. Would you forget to eat? I mean, if some people ate the Bible, so to speak, like they eat physical, ate physical food like they ate the Bible, uh, they would starve to death. They would come, for example, on a Sunday morning and they'd eat a big meal, as it were. And then they go back on Sunday evening, 
and then Monday and Tuesday and nothing and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and Sunday they're about to die they're a bag of bones and they come in on Sunday morning and they grab the meal the plate and they eat it this is crazy you should be reading the Bible every single day just like you eat every single day number two you should also read the Bible attentively just like you eat your meal now who has ever fallen asleep eating a meal Maybe if they're really tired, I guess, but when you eat, you sit up straight. When you eat, you're sitting up uh, or sitting up straight, so to speak, in a proper posture to make sure that you can take that food into your mouth. So the same is true. When they heard the words of God in the book of Nehemiah, they were all attentive to the words the Bible says. The same thing when Jesus was preaching. They were listening to him with great focus. Same with Job, what he says. So we should therefore, just like we eat with great focus, great attention, I'm going to make sure that this spoonful of this soup goes into my mouth. I'm going to make sure that this verse goes into my heart. As I'm reading, I'm focusing, I'm paying attention. I'm not falling asleep. I'm not lacking in attention. I'm not laying down. But rather, I am focused. I am attent reading the word. Number three, Proverbs chapter 13 and verse number 25. You should read the Bible abundantly, just like you eat enough food to satisfy your stomach. Does anyone take a plate of rice and just put one grain on it and think that that's enough? But there are many Christians today who will just open the Bible like this. They'll point to one verse, they'll read it. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. All right, thank you, God. And that's enough for me today. That's one grain of rice. We want a whole plate of rice. I want multiple chapters. I want, as it were, sometimes uh, a book or two of the Bible. So you should eat abundantly, as the Bible says. Drink Eat, O friends, yea, drink, drink abundantly, O beloved. So God commands us, therefore, in some way to eat the word of God, to, I says in Isaiah, eat sufficiently. Proverbs chapter number 13, chapter 25, the Bible says, at the end of this chapter, The righteous eateth to the satisfying of his soul, but the belly of the wicked shall want. What this primarily means is that someone who is a righteous person is going to be blessed by God to where he has enough to be able to eat what he needs to survive and to be actually satisfied as it says elsewhere, the soul of the righteous is what we've made fat. Uh, but the person who's wicked, the Bible says God will cast his substance away. God's going to make him a poor man and he's not going to be able to eat what he needs. He's going to actually starve. Well, I can see then a parallel here. When you're a righteous person, you're eating a lot spiritually. When you're a wicked person, you're not eating anything spiritually. You're wasting away spiritually. Eat the word of God. Deuteronomy 8, 3 says, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know, that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeded the mouth of the Lord doth man live. When God led the children of Israel through the wilderness, he taught them this lesson that I'm explaining to you right now. How did he do it? Well, what he did was he decided to cut them off from the opportunity to grow crops by making them to be nomadic and wandering around the wilderness. So therefore, they would not be able to provide for themselves in this way. So what they had to do was rely upon God to provide a special miracle every single day, where manna would come down from heaven, it says in Exodus chapter 16, that man did eat angels' food, which is called, in the same chapter, bread from heaven. And Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father, Jesus says. So God had given them that manna. It is the, a symbol of the word of God. Now there were two things very interestingly about this manna, this thing that we have to eat, this as coriander seed. First of all, the Bible describes that it would only come and stay until the afternoon. When the sun was hot, it would melt away. So if you didn't get the manna early in the morning, you didn't get manna, you didn't eat that morning. The same thing with reading the Bible. I think it's a great idea for you, just like when people wake up to eat, you should wake up and read the Bible. Perhaps even the first thing you do in the morning is to read the Word of God. Now listen, you don't have to read the Bible for two hours to read the Bible. You could read for 10 minutes. You could read for 20 minutes. And you could get a small meal of the Word of God in your soul. Get that manna early in the morning before the sun of carefulness, before the sun of worries of this world burns it away into where you don't have the opportunity. Oh, I'm so busy. I've got so many things going on. Make sure you wake up early and get that manna. The second thing about the manna, the Bible says of the manna, that they had to go and collect it every day, and that they weren't allowed to store it until the next day. Otherwise, it would say it would breed worms and stink. So they had to get the manna every single day, a daily retrieval of the Word of God, just like you. Don't be like people who rely on the old manna. I remember I saved a man in Uganda very early on, and he was an old man, and he said, you know, I've learned from you that I'm supposed to read the Bible every single day. He said, but I, I read the Bible once or twice, and I, for years I said, that's enough for me. I don't need the Word of God anymore. I already got enough of it. This is what a lot of Christians think. 
They think that, for example, I've already eaten a lot of manna yesterday, I don't need any more today. But you know that you're supposed to just like eat, eat, or eat, or do, would you say that? I had a big buffet three days ago, I don't need to eat today. No, you would want to eat again today, physically. So the same thing spiritually. Treat the Word of God like your spiritual food. Number two, God's Word should be treated also like a spiritual treasure. God's Word is not merely the food spiritually that you eat, but is also the treasure that you're supposed to acquire. All the worldly riches that are in this uh, uh, world below us, uh, where we are, uh, they are nothing compared to the far surpassing glory and the riches of the Word of God. Amen. Earthly uh, things, things that are seen, are all temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And the words of the Lord last forever. The words of the Lord endure forever. So we must make sure, therefore, that we are seeking the treasure above, that we are seeking the treasures of the Word of God. The book of Proverbs talks of wisdom, which in a symbol is the Word of God, and it says that we should seek it as silver, as for hidden treasure. Some kind of like a, a, a very uh, elaborate uh, hidden chest full of riches that you would go after. I often use this analogy in Uganda. Let's imagine that I had a big treasure chest, very big one, and I filled it with all sorts of gold and silver and diamonds and rubies and gems, just millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of stuff. And I were to go and bury that in a field, and I go and tell everybody around uh, Kempal, and I say, hey, there's this chest full of, and I show it to them, they might believe me only if I show them, you know. I show them the chest, I'm going to bury this chest over in that field over there on some indiscriminate day in the next couple of weeks. And the first person to dig it up gets it all. You know what they would immediately do? They would all quit their job. They would go and buy all the shovels they can get. They would be on two phones calling all their family from the village. And they would say, come to Kampala. We're going to get rich in a couple weeks. Because they want that hidden treasure. But the word of God, though it be not in the same form, yet it is gold. And it's a black cover. And there's treasure in here. Gold, silver. But I don't see people running to this. I don't see people flocking for this. And the reason why they don't do it is because they don't see the value in the Word of God. They don't see that it is actually greater than anything in this world. That we should love it, the Bible says, above gold, yea, above fine gold. That we should wholeheartedly love the Word of God. And he says, incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. Someone who loves the Word of God like a treasure. You see, all the treasures of this world are fading. They don't last forever. The Bible says that the words of God and the words of the things, the things of God are durable riches. But the things of this world, they make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven, so says the scripture. I think a really good analogy or a symbol of the transitoriness of this world's riches is that which is given in a popular board game here called Monopoly. And on that game Monopoly, if you know about it, it's a board game where everyone has pieces and they roll the dice to go around the board. And the role of the game is to make everyone else go bankrupt. You want to get all the money, you want to get all the property. So if you can get all the money, you can get all the property, then you're the person who wins. And usually if the game ends right, one person does get all the property and all the money. Usually it ends because someone gets angry they lost and flips the board over. <laughs> but if it ends properly, some person is, as it were, in paper money, in paper property, so to speak, they are rich. Well, the same thing at the end of, but what happens at the very end of the game? Well, everything goes back in the box until you play again. The same thing happens at the end of your life. Maybe you're going to be successful. Maybe you're going to become this businessman who gets all the riches and all the land and all the property and you make everyone else go bankrupt. And then someone else says, maybe you're the poor person. Maybe you're the person who goes to jail but doesn't have to get out of jail free card. Maybe you're the person who uh, barely gets by with just one little small property or whatever. And even that, you're eventually cast out of the game. Well, the rich and the poor meet together in death. Because at the end of your life, just like at the end of that game, it all goes back in the box. That's right. And it doesn't matter how much money you got, doesn't matter how much wealth you acquired, doesn't matter how much land you possessed, all of it at the end of your life is meaningless. It's vanity of vanities. But there is one treasure that you could take with you to heaven. This, the knowledge of the Word of God. Godliness, which is profitable in all things. Having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Where you have a durable riches of the Word of God, the wisdom of Scripture. You are a fool if you lay up treasure for yourself and you're not rich toward God. You're merely laboring for the wind, running after the wind. What does that mean? That means the wind blows this way, so I start running in this way. And so the wind blows that way, now I start running this way. So is every fool who runs after money, instead of chasing after the word of God, the value of it. Turn to Revelation chapter 2. Let me show you something. I thought this was really cool when I saw it. Revelation chapter number 2. 
God puts these kinds of things in the scripture and he wants us to find them, the gems of the word of God. Let me give you one right now, particularly pertaining to the fact that the word of God is our riches. In Revelation chapter 2, he's talking to the church at Smyrna, and he says this in verse 9, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. Now notice in the Bible that that is in parenthesis. You can see a statement, but thou art rich, right after he had just said that you are poor. What that means is that the church in Smyrna was physically poor, but they were spiritually rich. They had nothing physically, but they had everything spiritually. Now watch, look at chapter 3, at the end of the chapter, verse 17. Watch God say the exact opposite to the church of Laodicea. He says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not. So you say you're rich, and maybe you are physically. Maybe you have lots of possessions. Maybe you have lots of things in this world, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. The person who has all the wealth of this world but doesn't have the treasure of the Word of God, the knowledge of the Word of God, the precepts of the Word of God guiding their life is a poor person. And the person who doesn't have anything, the person who lives on a very small income, the person who has uh, almost nothing to their name, financially speaking, but they have this book, they have the Word of God, and they read there in all the days of life, that's a person who is rich spiritually. That's a person who has, as it were, the real abundant life. Number three. God's word I told you is your spiritual food. You must eat God's word. Number two, God's word is your spiritual treasure. You must work for and labor for, laboring in the word to understand it and apply it in your life. Number three, God's word is a spiritual guide. Why don't you go ahead and turn to the book of Proverbs chapter four. Proverbs in chapter four. Now obviously, I don't need to tell you, but we're all heading somewhere in life. All of us are walking on a pathway. But most people are not walking in the path that God wants them to walk on. Most people are not going in the direction that God wants them to go in. The Bible says in the book of Psalm chapter 119 that thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So that God's word enlightens our steps. It guides our way. It tells us the right way in which we are to go and takes us away from the bad ways in which we're not supposed to go. And all of us has a kind of candle. The Bible says that the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. He will light my candle. And every day what you need to do is take your candle and go to the Word of God and light it. You need to get that light of God's Word guiding you and directing you. If I was in a country that I didn't know where I was going, like when I first got to Uganda, I would get a guide. I would get someone to direct me. I would say, where is this? Or how do I get here? Or how do I get this? And I would ask him questions and he would tell me where to go. So also we are living in a world that needs a guide. We're living in a world where you need to have light to walk in the darkness, among whom ye shine, he says, as lights in the world. So you must have the guide of the Word of God in your life. If for no other reason, also for a moral one, that if you, for example, do not have the Word of God brightening your way, then you're going to make a lot of foolish decisions in your life. Remember that there was a time in the king of Israel, or king of Judah, uh, the, the, the kingdom of Judah, where they forgot the word of God. And then he says, I have, the Hilkiah, I have found the book of the law of the Lord. So that they were living in darkness, and great, it says, is the wrath of the Lord which is kindled against this place. Why? Because they had forgotten the word. Because they were not reading the scriptures at all. In fact, Paul says in Romans chapter number 7, that I had not known uh, a sin but by the law. For except the law had said thou shalt not covet, I had not known less except the law had said thou shalt not covet. So Paul says that there are certain things that you won't know are wrong unless you read the Bible. Let me give you a couple examples of things many people don't know are wrong until they read the Word of God. Many people will tell you it's okay for you to drink alcohol, to drink what the Bible would call the poison of dragons, the cruel venom of asps, drinking of the vine of Sodom and Gomorrah, but the Bible tells us that wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Many people are told in Uganda, and perhaps even here, that Jesus himself turned water into wine. So therefore, we can drink alcohol. It's okay for us to drink alcohol. But they do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God, because they don't read the word of God and understand that if Jesus truly was giving them alcohol, they would be getting twice drunk. And therefore, is Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. No, the Bible clearly tells us that you're not supposed to look upon the wine when it is red, when it gives its color in the cup, when it moves itself right. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. As foolish as a person taking a cup of poison from a snake and drinking it, so would it be for you to drink alcohol. So I didn't know that. Well, that's because you didn't read the Bible. 
There are other people, for example, who think it's not okay to be a fornicator or to cohabit and live with someone before they're married to the person. But the Bible calls this sin. It calls it fornication, and it says to flee it, to run away from it, to get it far away from it. The Bible says God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. And he therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man but God. Or that it's a sin for someone to get divorced and to get remarried after getting divorced. Jesus calls this adultery. So I didn't know that. I had no idea. Well, that's because you don't read the Bible. I remember one time there was this uh, high school uh, uh, friend of mine, and she was a Christian. I don't know if she was saved. But she one time, uh, towards the end of her time in high school, got a tattoo on her foot. Now, you'll never believe what tattoo she got. Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. But this is a contradiction, isn't it? If she was actually reading the Bible, she would have read Leviticus 19.28, which says not to print any marks upon you. And then she wouldn't have put the tattoo on her foot. So is the word of God really a light in a path, uh, a light to her path? No. She was actually living as a fool, and it's a mark of her eternal stupidity, not for reading the Bible. Say, I didn't know that. You should have read God's word, and you would have understood what the Bible says. Proverbs chapter 4, verse number 18. The Bible says, but the path of the just is as the shining light that shines more and more into the perfect day. Let me tell you something. When you read the Bible, your life gets brighter and brighter. Things get more exciting every day. Things become more clear. The Word of God enlivens your soul. It comforts you and strengthens you to the point where you're able to do a mighty thing for God and you're able to have uh, happiness and joy all the day. Uh, I, uh, anyway, so Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18, and then verse 19. Here's the opposite. Not just so, uh, someone who's righteous, who reads the Word of God, uh, that person will have brightness and light in their life. What about the wicked person? The one who doesn't read the Bible. Verse 19 says, The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. What does that mean? That means that that person is walking in darkness and they know not where they're going because the darkness has blinded their eyes. That's a person who's trying to find the seat, but they just can't seem to find it. That's a person who's trying to find their way, but they can't. You see, if I wanted to reach that seat right over there, all I would have to do with my eyes open, with the Word of God as my guide, so to speak, I just have to walk over and then I just sit down and I found the seat. But if you're a wicked person, you're not reading the Bible, then uh, things are going to be dark to you. You're going to have your eyes like this. And you're going to come over here, you're going to stumble and break this. Then you're going to stumble over here. Then you're going to fall down over here. And then eventually, after 15 years, you'll find the seat. Oh, I really messed up my life. Because you didn't read the Bible. Because you didn't look into the Scripture. Because you didn't get the guide first. You didn't ask the guide, the Lord God in His Word, what I ought to do, how I ought to go. The Bible says in verse 20, My son... Attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Don't be stiff-necked and hard-hearted. Don't refuse the word of God. If you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Verse 21. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Let the word of God be your guide all the days of your life. And finally, fourthly, God's word is our spiritual medicine. The Bible says, turn to Psalm 119, one last place. Psalm 119. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones of wisdom. And the Bible tells us then that the word of God is like a medicine to you. It's this thing which is able to heal your soul. It's the balm of Gilead for your pain. It's the water for your cleansing. It is the binding roller for your wounds. It is the juice for your infirmities. This is for your health, as Paul said when he told them to take bread, and as I tell you, to take the word of God. It is a medicine to you. It can have a profound effect upon the way that you feel, a profound effect upon the way that you think. The Word of God describes its ability to transform you. Psalm 119 and verse 50, it says that this is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. There have been many times where I was very depressed. There were many times where I was very afraid. There were many times where I was very anxious. And then I just hear one word of the Scripture, one verse from the Word of God, one statement by Jesus, and it immediately calms the billow's foam. Immediately all of the tempest goes away because the word of God, it says, has quickened me. I was comforted in my affliction by the word of God. How much peace you forfeit when you don't read the word of God, when you don't meditate in the word of God by reading it every single day. It is a spiritual medicine to you. But it's force for you. It's not just that you won't be comforted. It's not just that you won't be cleansed. It's not just that you won't be made whole in a spiritual way, but it is that you're actually dying and that you need this word to preserve your life. If I told you that you have a terminal illness and you believe me, and that your illness is unto death, 
but hey, there's a, there's a pill that you can take. And if you take it every single day and you don't miss it one single day, then you'll live for a very long time. I think that you would not only buy every pill that you could find at the pharmacy of that pill, but you would also set 15 alarms on your phone and another phone, and you would tell all of your family members to remind me to take that pill every single day. Well, here's a pill you have to take every day. Otherwise, something bad is going to happen in your life, and your life will not be prolonged. In fact, you will not live long in the land which the Lord your God gives you to possess. You must read these words every single day. It is your health, and if you don't, it will be your destruction. I told you that God's word is your spiritual food. You must eat it every day. I told you that God's word is your spiritual treasure. You're supposed to seek it every day. I told you that God's word is your spiritual guide. You're supposed to ask at it every day. I told you that God's word is your spiritual medicine. You're supposed to administer it to yourself every single day. Read the word of God. Continue in Christ's word. Then you will be his disciple indeed. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that you bless everyone here who has come to understand the word. Lord, I pray that you would bless those who are desirous not merely to understand the word themselves, but also to minister the same to others. Lord, it's very difficult for us uh, to break out of our comfort zone and to begin to uh, live a life of uh, selflessness and uh, other-centeredness. But I pray that you would give all of us the grace to do it, to where we would have uh, other people deeply within our hearts, to where we would want to minister to them and serve them and give them the wisdom and the knowledge that you have given to us at, uh, 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 for free. So I pray that we would also administer the same for them uh, in whatever capacity that you give to us. Bless us then with the Spirit of God also as we continue in your word to continue to be your disciples indeed. In Jesus' name, amen. For our last song, let's turn together to song 374. <laughs>